Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O Lord, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory, strength and honor, give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. In His arms, He carries them all day long. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the true. Today's scripture reading will be from Romans 8, 35 through 39. Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are all killed. We are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers nor things present, nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, today is a big day in the community of Atlanta, because tonight at 6 o'clock, we kick off our evening worship service, and so we encourage you to be back tonight at 6 o'clock for our evening worship. Actually, tonight, I, I want you to come back, because I want you to come back every Sunday night, but tonight I've got a special lesson inspired by the Atlanta Falcons slogan. Our sermon tonight is Rise Up, and my intent is to show you how their slogan is applicable to our walk with God. So I encourage you to come worship with us before, before you watch the game at 6 o'clock. Uh, something you may not know about me is that I have been very successful in my life at weird injuries. I, I, I've been very successful at obtaining weird scars. And, and I don't know what it is, but when you get guys together at some point in their life, they're going to compare scars. And, and I have some very, very strange stories behind some of the wounds that I've incurred over the years. For instance, when I was about 10 years old, I stepped on a pencil, uh, and it broke off inside my foot, right where the toe meets the, 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 the actual foot. And we went to the doctor and told him I stepped on a pencil, the lead broke off, he could not find the lead. So he left it inside my foot. He didn't believe it was in there. I guess he didn't believe I would tell the truth. 
A year later, it worked its way up through the top of my foot and exited uh, on its own. So I've got a weird story there. I know I probably just lost half of you with a gruesome story. When I was in college, my freshman year of college, a group of us went from Harding down to Little Rock, Arkansas, and we went ice skating. And there was a, a young lady there that I was trying to impress. It was not, was not Sarah yet. But I was trying to impress this young lady, so I was teaching her how to ice skate, uh, and she was holding on to my, my, my arm while we were doing it. Uh, and, and then uh, some friends showed up and were calling for, for me from outside the rink. And so I, I told her to hang on. She, she grabbed hold of somebody else. But as I was leaving to go to the uh, outside of the rink, she grabbed hold of, she lost her balance, grabbed hold of the back of my shirt, dropped me to the ground, and then somebody ran over my right pinky with their ice skate. And I can show you that scar. That, that, that nail grows a little funky. But the, the one that I, I remember the most, it was just a few years ago when I was still a youth minister, and I took the boys out to the beach to play football. I love playing football on the beach because you can go tackle on the beach. It doesn't hurt too bad. And in the midst, midst of a play, I'd caught a reception, and I ran it for a touchdown. And in the process, I had to stiff arm one kid. And I, I stiffed armed him good. I ran it in for the score, and I was done. But then I realized my pinky was dangling. I broke it in the process of stiff arming this guy. So I had to go to what is known as the Andrews Institute, a very popular hospital in the Pensacola region, very big with orthopedic medicine and, and a lot of professional athletes. Even Tom Brady has gone there for a surgery before. And I'm in the, the, uh, the, the pre-op room, and I could hear conversations between other people in there. And I came to realize that I was in there with three pro athletes, three pro football players. Two of them were offensive linemen for the Jacksonville Jaguars. One of them was a linebacker for the Buffalo Bills. And I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, I'm here with my football injury too. <laughs> and I scored the touchdown. So, but I've got, now I've got some scar on the other pinky. The right pinky has the ice skate. The other pinky has the... Uh, uh, the, the football injury. So I've had my share of injuries, and my guess is you have yours too. In fact, my guess is that after this service, I'm going to have a few individuals come up to me to tell me their injury stories. And that's fine. That's great. Let's compare. But, but we've all been wounded at some point in our past. We've all incurred that kind of damage. And the thing is, some wounds take a long, long time to heal. And my guess is that there are some of us today who have struggled for a long time with something that happened a long time ago. As one preacher said, there are a few types of bondage that are greater than the prison of the past. And so we may find ourselves bound, bound by, by a, a wound that was inflicted on us by another person, and we cannot forgive it. Or we may find ourselves bound by a wound that we inflicted on someone else and we cannot forget it. Either way, the past has the capacity to incarcerate the present. And if you are still trying to heal from something in your past, I encourage you this morning to take comfort in the fact that God is greater than your past. Regardless of if it's a wound you've incurred or a wound you've inflicted, God is greater than your past. And let me show you why. Because when we look at Scripture, there's some things we learn about God. God is greater than our past, first and foremost, because if I am in Christ, then God does not remember my past sins. This is a beautiful characteristic of God that sometimes gets overlooked. You see, you and I have this thing called a memory, and it doesn't necessarily go away. It might fade, it might reduce, but there are still particular events in our past that we can't forget. And yet with God, God has this amazing ability that when He forgives, He forgets simultaneously. He's like the computer that erases everything on the hard drive. It's not there anymore. Or at least in a technical sense, it's not there anymore. And so God has this ability that we don't have. And the one thing we need to understand about God is that He is not a record keeper when you enter Christ. Instead, instead, He is the record remover. So consider these passages. Psalm chapter 130 and verse 3. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? If He was a record keeper, who could stand? But the very next verse of Psalm 130, verse 4. But with you there is forgiveness. And then Psalm chapter 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. 
This is a beautiful metaphor. Because the author didn't choose north and south. If you choose north and south, the reality is you can go north, but at some point, at some point, you're going to start heading south if you travel north. But if you head east, is there ever a moment in heading east that you will ever start heading west? Geographically speaking, would you ever stop going east? You see, the comparison that's being made here, the metaphor that's being used, is that when God forgives, he puts it so far away that you'll never find it. There's also Micah chapter 7 and verse 19, which says, He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. It's another envisioning of casting away our sins so far that you'll never find them. Putting them in a place that's so distant that you can't discover them. And then there's Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 25, where God proclaimed of himself, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Do you understand how beautiful that statement is? That when God forgives, God forgets. So if I am in Christ, then God does not remember my past sins. And on top of that, if I am in Christ, then God does not define me by my past mistakes. This is amazing when you journey through Scripture and discover this. Because the Bible is filled with several heroes who possess some serious skeletons in the closet. Think about Abraham for a moment. Abraham was a liar. But Abraham is not remembered as a liar. Abraham is remembered as the father of many nations, as Genesis chapter 17 and verse 4 describes him. Or think about Moses. Moses was a murderer. But he is not remembered as a murderer. He's remembered as a prophet like no other, as he's referenced in Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse 10. There's Gideon, who started his career as a coward. But he's not remembered as that. He's remembered as the mighty warrior that he's identified as in Judges chapter 6 and verse 12. David was an adulterer, but he's remembered as a man after God's own heart, as Acts chapter 13, 13 verse 22 describes him. Peter was a denier, but he's remembered as an apostle of Jesus Christ and a fellow elder. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1 as well as chapter 5 and verse 1. And Paul was the notorious persecutor of the church, but he's remembered as the apostle to the Gentiles in Romans chapter 11 and verse 13. You see, you have all these great characters in Scripture who have had their faults, who have done wrong, who have great sin counted against them. But that's not how they're remembered. Because those who are in Christ are not defined by their past mistakes. I want you to consider the ramifications of a couple of passages. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 4, we're, we're told how we enter Christ. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. The passage is talking about a death and a new life that your past is buried, and that newness exits. In verse 6 of the same chapter, Paul continues and says, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from death. In other words, what Romans chapter 6 says is that when we enter Christ through baptism, we become free from the sins of our past, from the mistakes of our past. Then there's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. It says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You're new when you're in Christ. What, how beautiful is that fact? In fact, in Christ, we are not pardoning criminals who will always have a record. Instead, we are adopted children who are received into the family of God. That's the difference. I don't know how many of you will remember this name, Jeffrey Dahmer. It's not a name you like to talk about because Jeffrey Dahmer is considered one of the worst serial killers in our history. 
From about 1987 to 1991, he killed 16 or 17 different individuals, but what made his more notorious was his, his involvement in dismemberment and cannibalism. I'm really not trying to gross you out, just trying to help you remember this gruesome character. He was finally arrested, found guilty, had 900 plus years of sentence tacked onto him. But while in prison, there was a woman out of Virginia named Mary Mott, a member of the Lord's Church, who sent him the World Bible School's correspondence course. And Jeffrey Dahmer began taking it. Eventually, he came to the decision that he wanted to be baptized. And so the preacher, his name was Roy Ratcliffe. He was the preacher at the Mandrake Road Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. He was contacted, and he went and met with Jeffrey Dahmer on May 10th of 1994. And baptized him for the forgiveness of his sins in the prison whirlpool. Following that baptism, Mr. Ratcliffe met with Jeff, as he called him, weekly for Bible studies. In fact, he met with Jeff five days before Jeff was murdered in prison for their last Bible study. Many have questioned the sincerity of Jeffrey Dahmer's baptism, as well as the possibility of whether or not he could actually spend eternity in heaven. And I don't know what Jeffrey Dahmer's eternal future will be, but what I do know is that the grace of my God is sufficient to cover his sins. Because Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5 and verse 20, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. And so anyone who is in Christ, even someone who's done as horrible of things as Jeffrey Dahmer did, has the possibility of having them erased, at least from the, 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 the memory of God, for the purpose of salvation. Because our God doesn't treat us like pardoned criminals. He adopts us like children. Let's never forget that when it comes to our past, when we're in Christ, we have no past. Because God forgives. Because God doesn't define us by our past. And since God is greater than our past, because God is greater than our past, there are some things that you and I need to be able to do. First and foremost, because God is greater than my past, I must be able to let go of my guilt. See, there's a great many people who struggle with the guilt of their past, with hanging on to what they've done in the past and not letting go of it and letting it determine their future. You see, God intended for guilt to be corrective rather than crippling. I want you to hear Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9-11. through 11. He said, I rejoice not that you were made sorry, speaking to the Corinthian congregation, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. In other words, what he's saying is that you felt sorrow. You felt guilt. You felt shame. But what it produced in you had positive results. It led to repentance. It led to the clearing of yourselves. And that's what guilt is supposed to do. You know, when... when God created us with this thing called free will. He, it, it came with a thing called a conscience. And you can go back to Adam and Eve, to the Garden of Eden, and you can see their conscience triggered as soon as they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because instantly they felt shame. Instantly they recognized their guilt. Instantly they realized that they had sinned. And what we discover in their example is that guilt is necessary in order for us to recognize sin. Without guilt, there's no recognition of sin. Without guilt, there's no repentance. So corrective guilt is God's tool for leading mankind to the recognition of sin and therefore leading us to repentance, therefore leading us to salvation. Corrective guilt is intentional and useful. But guilt can be crippling. And it can be crippling when it attacks our self-worth. We need to realize that our worth is not bound 
to our guilt or innocence. According to legend, an American tourist in Paris purchased an inexpensive necklace at a trinket shop, a trinket shop and was, was really surprised when he traveled back through U.S. Customs that he had to pay a high duty for it. So he decided, I need to go get this checked out and find out how much it's worth. Get it appraised. And he took it to a jeweler who put it under a microscope and began examining it and instantly offered him multiple thousands of dollars for the, for the necklace. And he thought that was interesting, so he decided to go to someone else and, and see what they thought. Took him to another jeweler. And that jeweler tacked on another $10,000 to what he was offering to buy the necklace right then and there. And the man said, what, what's so special about this necklace? I, I, I bought it very inexpensively in a little, little shop there in Paris. What's so special about it? And the jeweler said, Come look through the microscope. And when he did, there was an inscription from Napoleon to Josephine. The value of the necklace was based on its identification and association with a famed leader. Your value is not found because of you. You are valuable because God created you. In His image, God created you. Your value is attached to the one in whose image you're made. Your value is attached to the one who commissioned your existence. And the one who paid for your salvation. And so when we allow grip, guilt to cripple us, when we allow guilt to hang over us, we're devaluing ourselves. If we refuse to forgive ourselves, then we're, we're deeming ourselves unworthy of God's love, despite the fact we've been told that nothing can separate us from His love. We read a moment ago from Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39, and it describes us as more than conquerors through Him who loved us, and the reason is because there is nothing that separates from us from His love, neither, di- no, neither death nor life, angels or rulers, things present or things to come. Those are time references. The passage goes on to say that that there is nothing in all of creation that can separate us from His love, not even our past. Guilt withholds such conquering love from us. Guilt says, I don't deserve this. But thanks be to God that His love has never been conditioned on what we deserve. God loves us unconditionally. And that means, I want you to hear this, that means that you can do nothing right now to make God love you any less than He already does. And that means you can do nothing right now to make God love you any more than He does right now. God's love is unconditional. And thinking about this guilt thing, about feeling undeserving of of forgiveness, of love, think about the Great Commission. The Great Commission requires us to love God and to love others. But there's a third category in there because implicitly the Great Commission requires us to love ourselves. Because that second part, love your neighbor as yourself, within it is the expectation that you know how to love yourself. And so if you're going to love others, you kind of have to know how to love yourself based on that passage. And when we refuse to forgive ourselves, we're clinging to, to our old lives rather than embracing our new ones that we've already talked about. And Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 23, instructs us to put off our old self. And Paul, in a similar letter, Colossians Colossians 3, he tells us to put on the new self that's created after the likeness of God. Obviously, Paul's instruction is for us to stop leading lives of sin. But inherent within his instructions, there's an expectation that we will let go of our past as we embrace a new future in Christ. So clinging to guilt is, a, is, is kind of a failure to put off the old self. I want you to think about two characters in Scripture for a moment. Peter and Judas. You know, when you really explore the sins that Peter and Judas committed there in the, in the last hours of Jesus' life, They're essentially the same sin. Rejecting Jesus for selfish reasons. Judas betrayed Jesus for a financial reward, while Peter denied his relationship with Jesus for the purpose of self-preservation. Both of them are rejecting Jesus in their respective capacities. And the thing is, both Peter and Judas regretted their actions. Both of them felt sorrow and remorse and guilt. 
We're told in Matthew chapter 27, verses 3 through 4, that Judas was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver and even went so far as to say, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And we know with Peter that immediately after that last rooster crowed, he went out and wept bitterly, demonstrating sorrow, demonstrating remorse. So the difference between these two guys really isn't the sin they committed, and it really isn't their response to the sin and the remorse they felt. The difference between the two is how they handled their guilt. Judas was crippled by his guilt. He decided that he no longer deserved to live, so he went out and hanged himself, according to Matthew chapter 27, verse 5. But Peter... Peter will correct his guilt. Peter stuck around. Peter was able to witness the risen Christ. And as a result, Jesus gave him three opportunities to proclaim his love. In essence, to recount his denials. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Feed my sheep. And when the opportunity came to proclaim, to, to proclaim Christ or spare his life, the next time Peter boldly proclaimed Christ, saying, We ought to obey God rather than men, in Acts chapter 5. You know, because Judas let his guilt cripple him, he missed out on some great things. He missed out on the resurrection. He missed out on the, 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 the day that the Holy Spirit baptized those people in the upper room and the church was instituted. He missed the first gospel sermon when 3,000 souls were added to the church. He missed out on a lot of great experiences that came with overcoming guilt. And Peter became the chosen agent through whom the first gospel was preached. Peter became the, the agent through whom the first Gentiles received salvation. The, the difference between Peter and Judas wasn't how they fell, but how they recovered. Because everyone, everyone will fall at some point in time, as Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 tells us. But only the righteous will rise back up, as Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 16. So the question you have to ask yourself is, are you going to be a Peter or are you going to be a Judas? Are you going to let guilt consume you, or are you going to let guilt correct you? But guilt is not the only thing we have to let go of. We also have to let go of grudges. Some people let their wrongs become their prison. Some people let their wounds become their prison. Every one of us has done the father wrong at some point in time, and every one of us has been done wrong by, by a brother. Maybe somebody lied to you or somebody slandered you or somebody stole from you or somebody abused you or cheated you, abandoned you or broke their promise. And it's incredibly hard to let go of that. And as one minister said, the problem is that holding on to wrongs never turns out right. And what is a grudge anyway? The Greek word translated grudge is an echo. It means to be held or entangled or ensnared by something. And as a result, it also means to, to set yourself against someone or to hold a grudge against someone. In the English language, a grudge is a, a persistent feeling of ill will or resentment resulting from a past injury or insult. And so what's happening is when you are holding on to a grudge, you're holding something against someone you're refusing forgiveness of them. And granted, they may not deserve it. And granted, they, they still need to reconcile and they still need to repent. But grudges are problematic. And we can see people in Scripture who bore grudges. According to Genesis chapter 27 and verse 41, Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing that was taken from him. In Genesis chapter 15 and verse 15, Joseph's brothers are afraid that Joseph is going to hold a grudge against them after their father died. In Mark chapter 6 and verse 19, Herodias, the wife of Herod Antipas, had a grudge against John the baptizer and wanted to put him to death because John condemned their marriage since Herodias left her first husband to be married to Herod Antipas. And her first husband was Herod Antipas' half-brother. 
We see grudges. We know what grudges are. And sometimes they're so hard to let go of. Because we were wronged. But God intended for grudges to be eliminated from our hearts and replaced with love. I want you to notice a passage under Mosaic that comes from the, the Old Testament. It's Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18. And under low Mosaic law, grudges were forbidden. And here's what the text says. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, did you catch that? The second half of this command is where we get the second half of the greatest commands. That in conjunction with loving your neighbor as yourself, you're told not to hold a grudge against them. The two relate to one another because you can't hold a grudge and love at the same time. So under Mosaic law, grudges were forbidden. And in the New Testament, grudges are not specifically condemned or, or specifically addressed, but they're encompassed in other instructions. For instance, we're instructed to love our enemies, as Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44 says, which would include the ones that have wounded us in the past. And then, in fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, in that great definition of love, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, we're, we're told, the English Standard Version says to, to, that love is not irritable or resentful. Irritable or resentful. Another translation actually says it this way, love keeps no record of wrongs. And we're instructed in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, to, to put away certain behaviors that are associated with grudges. Behaviors like bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander and malice. And Colossians chapter 3 says that we're to put on these characteristics, to put on uh, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. That we're instructed to, to bear with one another and forgive one another as the Lord has forgiven you. And it's worth noting that the individual who wrote these put off and put on instructions in Ephesians and Colossians was Paul. And during both writings of both letters, he was in prison for things he didn't do. And here's a guy who has every reason to have a grudge in the moment, and he doesn't. The only way you can escape the bondage of bitterness is the life of love. A loving heart is the way you keep from being chained to the past. And I believe that the cross invalidates all reason for grudges. Because the one who went to that cross and had every reason to hold a grudge against the people who put him there said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And so the Father that requires no past of you does expect a certain kind of future because in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15 we're told, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And by it, many become defiled. It's very clear. We're instructed in Scripture to not hold on to our grudges. There's a story about Bill Clinton and Nelson Mandela. When Bill Clinton first met Nelson Mandela, he said to him, when you were released from prison, I, I woke up my daughter at 3 a.m. I wanted her to see this historic event. And as you marched from the cell block across the yard to the prison gate, the camera focused in on your face. I have never seen such anger and even hatred in any man as was expressed on your face at that time. And that's not the Nelson Mandela I see today. So what was that all about? And here was Mandela's response. He regretted that the cameras had caught his anger, that that was visible. And he said, as I was walking across the courtyard, this is what I was thinking. They've taken everything from me that matters. My cause is dead. My family is gone. My friends have been killed. And now they're releasing me, but there's nothing left for me out there. And I hated them for what they had taken from me. But then he adds, says that he heard an inner voice that said, for 27 years you were their prisoner, but you were always a free man. Don't allow them to make you into a free man, only to turn you into their prisoner. 
He later commented that an unforgiving spirit creates bitterness in our soul and imprisons our spirits. So a failure to forgive imprisons us. So we got to let go of the grudges. We got to let go of the guilt. Because God did not make us into prisoners within ourselves. I'm reminded of a passage that Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. Paul's an individual, as I've already alluded to, that had every reason to hang on to grudges because he was done wrong. He's, he had every reason to, to hold on to the baggage of guilt because he had committed some grave sins, even referring to himself as the chief of sinners at one point. But in Philippians chapter 2, um, chapter 3, verse 12 through 15, he says, Not that I've already obtained this, referring to, to, uh, to righteousness, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those who are mature think this way. Forgetting what lies behind. That it included his faults and his failures. That included his wounds and his wrongs. And he was forgetting that. And then instructed us in maturity to do the same. I'm not trying to stand up here and, and, and claim that letting go of your guilts and your grudges is easy. But I know that we have a father that can assist and a family that wants to as well. Maybe today you fall in the category where your past haunts you and you just can't let go of it. Know that your God is greater than your past because he's a God that forgives and a God that does not define you by your past. And right now your past can be changed. If you haven't become a child of God yet, confess your faith in Jesus Christ as the resurrected Son of God, repent of your sins and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins and that past of sin can be erased. And if you are his child and you let your past creep up on you, you return to your past behavior, well, now's the time to begin again. Won't you come? All together we stand.